So next, we will have uh, Shamshan Murtuza, advisor of the Department of English and Humanities at ULAB and professor of English at the University of Dhaka, who will be presenting a paper dealing with the figure of the shaman, which was already mentioned in our previous paper, but which is a figure that transcends all sorts of cultures, time periods, continents, etc. Uh, so, uh, uh, Dr. Shantan Mortuza, if you please come to the stage and show us your presentation on the return of the shop. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so this is probably the last session, right? Okay, so can you have an MCQ? Okay, so let's begin what you have learned in the last two days. Okay, so if you fail the test, you'll be you know, kicked out of this room, all right? Who's this? Gandalf. Great. Star Wars something. <laughs> yeah, I have an answer. Obi Wan Kenobi. Obi Wan Kenobi. Okay. Star Wars. Okay. Good. Marley. Marley. Very good. Prosper. Prosper. So what's okay? <laughs> Who's this guy? Get a fix. I know. So get a fix, right? So what's common? The old wizards. Okay. I thought you'd be saying all of them got beards. <laughs> These bearded guys. But here he is a shaman without any beard. Okay. Who's this? This is from William Blake. Satan, okay, and Eve. So you be sleeping, and Satan has just flown in and holding, yeah, a scepter kind of thing, right? This one, yeah. Aspers are used to have a Jim Morrison poster. I remember. Oh my the, God! The American Prayer. Yeah, yeah. It's lovely. Yeah. So, yeah. Wow. So in Venice Beach, they still have this house in which. Yeah, so I the doors. And doors is of course from Blake, right? I cannot so, but comment oh. your prodigious memory. No. <laughs> okay, from marriage and hell, uh, from the doors. So the name came from William Blake as wow. well. Now even Jim Morrison, okay. So he has been, you know, indoctrinated in the realm of the shaman. So these are all shamanic figures. <laughs> Alright, now who is a shaman? Well, these are the real shamans. And again, as Professor was mentioning, the Korean shaman and uh, because Mashu just mentioned, you know, uh, the shamans in, in the Caribbean. So they have, you know, so they don't look like these, you know, say figures here. But in real life, this is how they look, right? So a shaman is a priest doctor, you know, so found among various tribes around the world. Okay. Now the OED says a man or a woman. Very interesting, a woman. You know, who is regarded as having direct access to and influencing the spirit world, which is usually manifested during a trance, and empowers them to guide souls and cure illness. And that's the basic idea of the shaman, right? So you need to have access to the, you know, other world, spiritual world, and there you learn certain technique with which you return, and then with that you heal, you know, the community. All right. Now, the idea like, you know, became popular after the publication of Mircea Eliada. And I'm sure you know Mircea Eliada as, uh, as the notorious lover of Moitri Devi in Lanoi Bengali. Okay. And this Romanian, you know, so guy, like, you know, he wrote this huge encyclopedia of religion. And among other things, he also wrote the archaic techniques of ecstasy, in which for the first time he met Shaman a kind of a literary, uh, a, an object of literary interest. Of course, before that, you know, Professor Shubhita mentioned Malinowski and Fraser, you know, and others. Now, according to Eliada, so he was studying the Tunga people in Alaska, you know, and uh, for him, shaman is site specific, you know, so he cannot call a druid a shaman or he cannot call Jim Morrison a shaman. So each shaman has a bird of prey mother. This is very interesting. So you need to have 
you know, a kind of a spirit uh, other that will take you to the other world. Now, this mythical bird shows itself only twice, you know, at the shaman's spiritual part and at his death. It takes his soul to the underworld. When the soul has reached maturity, the bird carries it back to the heart, cuts the candidate's body, just like, you know, so this eating the flesh idea was mentioned, Mashur was saying, cuts the candidate's body into bits and distributes them among the evil spirits of disease and death. Each spirit devours the part of the body that is his share. This gives the future shaman the power to cure the corresponding diseases. So if you have a heart disease, okay, so the heart part will be given away and then, you know, so you have the ability to, you know, cure heart and all that. And after the departure of the disease, so the bird mother restores the bones to their places and the candidate wakes as if from a deep sleep. Right? And normally, you know, it's an intensive process. It's not that easy to be a shaman. So this whole process is not that easy, right? Now, how do shamans heal their patients, right? So I mentioned it, you know, in the opening uh, gambit a bit. So uh, Freud actually mentioned this, you know, and also Fraser. So um, and of course Malinus Canalis. So sympathetic magic, right? So sympathetic magic, you know, is this idea a shaman presumes sickness to address the sickness of the patients. So this whole process, so the part, the, you know, the possession aspect of it. So if you're possessed by the spirit, so you yourself, you know, are sick. And as a result, so shaman presumes sickness to address the sickness of these patients. So this, there is a Latin term for it, so similia similibus hirantur, which means like cures like. So in Bangla, it's probably Bisha right? Now, that is what voodoo is all about. So Freud referred to voodoo, you know, as a practice of treating an injury, like, you know, through an anointed knife. You know, so you have a waxen doll, and then, like, you, know, you fix it. You know, car statue of the injured person. So, and he identifies two principles. Okay, so one is similarity, so as in the carving, or the continuity, like you know, as you know, the weapon, like you know, this uh, uh, the knife itself. Now, in literary art, you know, so the principles, so we can you know uh, label them as metaphors and metaphors, books, and things, right? Say, and uh, the artist, therefore, like you know, why Jim Morrison, like you know, some call the French poet, you know, Campbell as, as a shaman. Now, why these terms are used? Because the artist, you know, is like a shaman because, and the literary work is magical. So that's what we have been talking about, right? So what I'm trying to do, I'm actually trying to summarize what has been said so far. There is nothing new that I can, I can add to what Professor Shubhidhar has said and what, you know, the Prasper has said. And of course, you know, everyone, we have tried to collectively uh, collectively construct the idea of magic in literature. So, and of course, Aristotle said art is an imitation of an action. So, you see the resemblance. So, all right. Now, the idea of shamanism, you know, is basically related to this idea of alternative spirituality. So, a shaman is a symbol of spiritual harmony, you know, and the ultimate oneness with one's own psyche. Now, this became very popular during the 1960s, you know, so you take, have this acid trip. You know, so like the Jim Morrison's uh, generation and others. So you have the psychedelic rock. And so the Vietnam War is going on. You cannot make sense of your reality and you're looking for like some form of alternative idea. And uh, this was, of course, earlier popularized by T.S. Eliot. You know, so his uh, idea of mythic voices. And in James Joyce, T.S. Eliot identified a myth kitty. You have a kitty bag of myth with which you try to fix the crisis of the Western world. So this Lazarus like, you know, regeneration of the Western culture that was there. But, you know, on the other hand, what has happened, so this new age vision quest kind of things, so if you type shaman on, you know, say on the internet, if you Google it, so there are so many new ages, like, you know, who are frustrated with, you know, this, uh, you know, materialistic world and so on. So they try to, you know, take this, you know, trip, you know, so they will go to Peru, they will go to Venezuela, they will come to Nepal, they will come, go to, you know, uh, Korea, Ma Malay people and whatnot. So these are the shamans who are um, mocked at by, so they're known as chicken shamans, you know, so this is a term they use in Nepal, you know, so those who come to climb Everest, so they will have, you know, kanjas and whatnot, and so they will pretend that they have 
a kind of oneness with the Himalayas and all that. So the Nepalese call them chicken shamans. The Native Americans, so these wannabes, so they're known as plastic shamans. You know, and then of course there are different New Age uh, fish and West people and all that. All right, but this is one book that really changed my perception of shamanism. And uh, this is a book that will actually bridge Professor Shubhidhar with Dr. Asper Sahib. Right? So this is a very interesting man called Michael Dusi, who is a professor at LSE, you know, uh, School of London, and he now teaches at Columbia University. And so as a young man, so he was a student of anthropology, so he went to Columbia right, and in order to study uh, medical anthropology. But what you realize that, you know, so the Indians, so like, you know, so they would do crazy things, you know, so they have nothing to do with spiritual oneness with nature, like, you know, I want to be in harmony with nature, so this tree-hugging kind of environmentalist, so that kind of idea, you know, does not exist. So Tusik says that, you know, they would even chop down one tree just to get one nut from the tree top, you know, because they don't want to climb up. All right? So they will throw the baby diapers into water, all right? and they will make up stories to do, uh, to cheat, you know, the white men. All right? So they, they were actually making up stories, so this whole idea of spirituality and all that, because the white men want to hear all these stories, and so the shamans, so it's their private joke, so they will say like, yes, I have seen God, I have seen tiger with, you know, snake heads, something like that, so they will make up stories, right? So the politics, you know, of epistemic mark and the fiction of the real in the creation of Indians, in the role of myth and magic in colonial violence. So this is kind of the resistance that Marshall was talking about. This is kind of resistance that Dr. Asperson was talking about. So role of myth and magic in colonial violence. In fact, Mukhtabi was talking about genocide earlier. So as much as in its healing and in the way that healing can mobilize terror in order to subvert it. Right. So they will assume a fearful stage right. so as an act of subversion. Through the tripping up of power in its own disorderliness. Right. So they will appear to be you know, the fearful other. You know, so, you know, just like uh, Professor Shuriker was saying, so like, you, know, the, you assume you know, a certain kind of power and you are marginalized. And from your margin, you, know, you unleash terror. So the shamans are very good at doing that. Right? So you, you use your marginal you know, location in order to assert yourself. And that's why it becomes post-colonial as well. So that is why my subject is you know, not the truth of being, but the social being of truth. Right? So this communal construct of truth, like the social being of truth. Not whether facts are real, but what the politics of their interpretation and representation. So it's very interesting. So suddenly, so this religious mumbo jumbo kind of thing. So suddenly, like we have a political agenda attached to the shamanic. So that's something that you know is very interesting because uh, in Venezuela, I remember like you know, when I went to the states for the first time. So uh, at UPenn, so the, the, the full writers, I'm sure, the orientation program. So I had a friend from Venezuela. And I, because I, I was about to study American Indian studies in Tucson, so I asked him, what about your Indians? And the guy simply said, we killed them. They don't exist. Right? And there was not, no single remorse in them, that there was no remorse whatsoever. We killed the Indians. Right? So they don't exist. Right? So the you know, smallpox given to the Native Americans to kill the population and all that, and how do you survive? you know, against such state violence. Right? So you come up with stories, right, in which, you know, you show your vigor and all that. Now, moving on, so, uh, to continue with Michael to see and what he says, so this is, uh, the book was published in 1986, but in 2002, so he gave a very long interview, all right, and uh, now this is available online and you can access it. And so uh, he, He's talking to Peter uh, Lambert Wilson and he says, magic has to do with fantasies about otherness. Right? So when I was reading this line again, so I was thinking of, so, you, know, you know, so this whole idea, it has to do with the fantasies about otherness. Right? So this is one definition of magic that we can take from the conference. 
Now, why to project, you know, magical powers onto blacks? Blacks would project, you know, magical powers onto Indians. Indians would project, you know, magical powers onto blacks. It was like a triangle that never stopped. So even like as a white man, you can be marginalized if you go to Venezuela, right? So like you know, so and if you have the black working in the uh, rubber uh, rubber industry, so that kind of relationship is there. So the two sides of racism. So suddenly, like you know, shamanism involves this racial connotation. So that's a very powerful idea actually. It applies to the relations between male and female. Right? So again, as for sir. You know, so suddenly gender issue comes in, so it does not have to be so the power lesson, like you know, have and have nots kind of thing, power and powerless. So male, female, black, white, and so on. So all the binaries get involved. Okay, so the shamanic involves all these binaries. Now in our own society, right here in the US too. So it's not only like you know, you need to look for your you know shamanic experience in Venezuela or Peru, so you can have that kind of discrepancy. You know, the battle between power and powerlessness, even in the states, right? So the magic, you know, so, you know, so the evil magic, so, and of course, the cash and capitalism gets involved. So these two things sort of ran together. The wandering Indian medicine men, and secondly, the nature of the magic involved, it gradually began to dawn on me. Now, in certain societies like the US, enlightenment, middle class culture prevails. The word of magic drops out, and eventually, you know, so enlightenment becomes the new proxy term for magic. So this rationality becomes the proxy term. And the word magic no longer uh, is needed. That is exactly what Rofixer was saying yesterday. That magic, you know, is redundant. It just called racism. So what is the magic now? So the magic is now racism. It's a bad thing. You shouldn't do it. People might come up with complex psychological, psychoanalytic theories. That's what we have been doing all along, you know, throughout the students. But the notion of a magical component is irrelevant if not inaccurate. So this whole idea that, you know, so this is exactly the problem I had, just, just a little bit about my own background. So I went to the States to University of Arizona to work on Scott Moore Day. So Scott Moore Day got the Pulitzer Prize in 1969 and he's the first Native American to get a Pulitzer Prize. Right? So, Fulbright placed me at, uh, university, at the University of Arizona in Tucson because he was teaching there. So I went to the student advisor and uh, so I wanted to sign up a course with Scott Momaday and they said that you, you really want to work under him and I said like, you know, why, what's wrong with him? He said, he's a red apple. He's a bloody red apple. And I said, like, what's the red apple? Because this is 1997, right? And I said, what's the red apple? So he's red. Outside is white inside. <laughs> okay, so I was not very convinced because I wrote my Fulbright proposal. So I, you know, walked into his class. So the class was already full, and uh, he was teaching probably great chemistry, you know. And he kept on saying, "I wish I could write like him," you know, in a very Oxford accent, right? And then I realized, like, you know, what they actually meant by red apple. Right? And the reason, like, you know, they did not like him because he was white, you know, throughout, like, you know, he was white. And here in the department, they were fighting for land rights, they were fighting for political economy, they were fighting for gaming rights, you know, mining rights, you know, so the change of human condition in the reservation. And here's a man, you know, you know, saying that I wish I could write like Fixer and, uh, like, you know, things like that, and Faulkner and things like that. So I decided to be a trickster. And I wrote my dissertation on the kind stories because I had to survive, you know. And just like a shaman, you know, survives, you know, in a hostile environment. So I had to survive in the department because I could sense there's a huge politics and of which I had no clue as an outsider, you know. So just like so, you know, when you're talking about this, you know, hush hush aspect of, of the voodoo, you know, uh, that, you know, it transforms. So same thing happened with ghost dance. You know, so the revival of the ghost dance within the American Indian community, because you know, so they do things, and like you know, just to reflect on Marshall's paper, you know, so there's four levels. For example, Navajo, you know, uh, you know, medicine man. So they would sing a song, so all these stammering and things like that, and 
you have access to up to the fourth level of interpretation. Okay. Only the Navajo medicine man would have access to the twelfth level of interpretation of the song. So for us, maybe it would appear as stammering or drum bit, you know, things like that. But the real magic will never be revealed by a Navajo medicine man. So yes, they will take you to their kidney, they will give you this, you know, smoke to pipe and all that, but they will never share those secrets and how it actually affects. And again, one personal story because uh, my professor, uh, Nancy Parezo, like one of my uh, three supervisors, she worked on Navajo sand painting. And uh, uh, Professor Parezo is an amazing woman. Okay, so she worked on Navajo sand painting and in Navajo sand painting, so you do designs uh, with sands and you conjure the spirit so, uh, with this imitation. So again, imitation of an action. But if you're an artist, so you must change certain portion of the frame. Right? So for example, uh, you uh, have the right left, uh, right leg in a, in a different direction. So that the spirit will know that this is not real. So the spirit will not come to that frame. So when my professor started working on her project, so she was an anthropology uh, student, so she was told that the Navajo medicine man said that, okay, we will give you access to this 12th level of, uh, you know, interpretation of the stories. Only if you promise that you will not conceive a child. All right? And eventually, this is going to harm one of your body parts. And Nancy Perezo, so she, you know, she, she was young at the time, but uh, she never had any child. Right? You know, just because of her research. So she, she's probably the uh, most uh, profound scholar on Navajo sand painting. And after the research was over, like you know, it took her almost uh, eight to ten years. So she developed uh, lung cancer. So just because she was working with the wind spirit, so as the Navajo medicine men said that one of your body organs, organs will, uh, will be affected. And sh so she's still alive, you know, so battling with her lung cancer. So she used to take her class uh, with this, you know, uh, head mic, and so she would be saying that, oh, I'm Madonna, like, you know, so you know, she, she, she takes it in a very, very sporty manner. So these are like, you know, wonderful scholars, and I'm really fortunate to come across uh, such wonderful scholars who take things really seriously. Right? And so they don't have anything to do with this uh, psychological interpretation that we do here. So, but the notion of a magical component is irrelevant if not accurate. Okay? So, but when you come into a peasant society where among certain strata of the population, a magical component is important, then you see it in this other way. This is exactly what Asperger was talking about this morning. Right? So you need the vocab, so language itself is magic. So the reason I use those personal anecdotes, you know, has to do with this idea that the language, uh, you know, contains magic. So when I would work through some of the stuff in the Kuka Valley, you know, which is in agribusiness, uh, you know, agribusiness, valley roads, banks, movie theaters, I wanted to explore the ramification of what I was now seeing as a network of racial activation. But Tusik, you know, so he approaches this whole thing you know, something different. So it's a kind of a racial attribution. And the uh, interview is called Ayahuasca and Shamanism. So that is actually a drug, right? So you, you, you go inside and for 48 days you stop, you know, suffer, and then they give you uh, this drug and you start vomiting, you know, so you're already starved and then you have loose motion, you have bowel movement. So shitting and vomiting, that's part of this, you know, vision trip. And then like, you know, Lucy says that, oh, I saw a leopard, with a bar's head, things like things like that. So yeah, it happens. So these hallucinations happen, but you know, so whether they really uh, involve the bard mother, so we don't know. And even Dusik, you know, he does not confirm that he went on those trips for 30 to 40 times. But still, you know, he was not convinced that you know, so he has actually come across those bard mothers. Anyway, now magic as a racial angle. So we talked about Harry Potter, and again, so Shubhendra sir mentioned this. You know, say for example, this whole idea of pure blood and mixed blood. So, to makes sense when you apply these ideas uh, 
you know, in your interpretation of Harry Potter, for example, Hermione. You know, so, you know, Draco Malfoy says, no one asks your opinion, you feel a little muddled, right? Or Remus Lupin says, Muggleborns are being rounded up as we speak. So Weasley says, but how are they supposed to have stolen ma magic? So you, if you are like, you know, art believe you know, so how are they supposed to have, you know, uh, magic? So Muggleborn, so ordinary people. Now the whole idea, so why Rowling is so popular, so we have been asking this question, you know, in different sessions. And so this whole idea that ordinary people can have extraordinary power, right? So that appeals to our, you know, unconscious, right? So how, why it becomes so popular? So this whole idea that even children, you know, can have extraordinary power, right? So this whole idea that, you know, so the powerless, you know, can be attributed with power, like, you know, the powerless can have power. So that's, that is an innate desire. And that has been very, you know, uh, cleverly and smartly, you know, uh, narrated by J.K. Rowling. Now, it is one interesting quote by Marshall Shalin. So, he says that, you know, what is happening today, so my title is actually, has changed a bit, so I'm calling it Return of the Magic. So, essentially, a globalization, you know, and against globalization. So this, you know, this new phenomenon that we are seeing, so the return of magic, return of vampire, narrative, return of, you know, whatnot. So this is kind of like, you know, yes, you have a globalization and you have, like, you know, against globalization, another kind of phenomenon. And so Marshall Charlin says that, you know, so yes, initially 19th century, so when the whites have more or less killed all the Indians, so they suddenly decided, well, we need to have some showcase objects. We need to have, you know, uh, our Indians. So just like on Adibashi Day, we bring our Monipuris and perform on TV, right? So we need to showcase our Indians, you know? So that's like, you know, kind of salvage anthropology. So that's the 19th century. So we need to have our reservation, protect their culture and all that. But, you know, so over the last 50 years or so, like, you know, these Indians, so they have gone to schools and they have gone to universities you know, and even asked for sales cash, you know, so the sandwich was provided by a Native American friend, you know, so that kind of idea, so they, they are going places, and now they are making changes to the system, right, just like task for a community and all that. So to revitalization of indigenous culture, so there has been a shift, right, so the indigenous culture is now being revived, you know, so, you know, so uh, uh, Silco, you know, Moma Day and others, like, you know, so George Harjo and others, so they are writing in the, for the mainstream, so they are making their presence felt. And now we're talking about Night Swan, now we're talking about the Navajo rituals, and so on. Now, modernization really means, you know, indig uh, indigenization. So this whole idea of this indigenous is now coming back, you know, into the, into the public forum. So that's Marshall Shah. But to see, being to see, so he said this is bullshit, right? So he said this is nothing but fake, you know, uh, process. This is a fake process. So what we are seeing in, in Harry Potter, in Asterix, you know, in other places, so this is nothing but fake. So what is this idea? So this is ultimately, you know, so dealing with, you know, our consciousness and the unconsciousness or the relation between the two. Now, one way of reaching the unconscious is narcotic substance drugs, you know. So that is the easiest way, like, you know, you don't want to starve, you do not want to have a priest doctor who will indoctrinate you. So you think that, you know, so drugs is one way of, you know, uh, having an alternative trip. But very interestingly, so Tusik makes a very, very interesting point. So who are producing these drugs? So the Colombians, the Mexicans, and they are supplying these drugs to the states. So yes, there could be a white, you know, entrepreneur somewhere, but, you know, so, you know, so the tide has turned, right? So this return, you know, so you are actually sending these drugs into the mainland, you know, and that is very, so yes, you're sending your coffee, you're sending your cocoa beans, but at the same time, you're sending drugs, right? And then you are making myth about these drugs, that what these drugs can do to you, right? So it will, you know, give you kind of a spiritual harmony and all that. So that's very interesting. So the, you know, so just changing the rule of the game. Now, here let me, you know, be a little more um, theoretical. And uh, again, I'm thankful to Professor Shubhendra because he mentioned in Macbeth you have this cauldron in which the blood is boiling, and that becomes the mirror. 
so the whole idea of this Lacanian image, right? So of course, so this is based on you know Freudian eat ego and super ego, right? So yeah, so it's pretty self-explanatory. So I'm not going into this idea of eat ego and super ego, but Laka does not use super ego. But you know, in the name of the father, so yes, so you have the big othering process, which you know tends to discipline you and all that. But behind the mirror, the idea line, so there's the other other. So that's the imaginary, illusory other, which you can never reach. So that's where the magic lies, because the ideal eye, you know, cannot be accessed. So you use this bard mother figure, or the spiritual helper figure, culture hero figure, whatever figure you need to, you know, in order to reach the other other, right? So that's the whole idea. So going beyond that mirror, so as a child you see your mirror image, but you know, the ideal eye is here. But here is a spiritual helper who can actually take you, behind that mirror. So that's the whole idea, right? So that's where, you know, so Laka can be helpful in understanding, you know, so the Shaman. Now, based on that, so this is what I propose, okay? And this is actually the unconscious, you know, so how the unconscious comes to be conscious, so the, how the unfamiliar becomes familiar. So that's the Freudian idea of the uncanny, so the unhomely becoming homely, so the unfamiliar becomes the uh, homely. Now, is it a return of the repressed? So our desires, you know, that are within our unconscious. Now, let's just change the, you know, uh, the variants, the, uh, the factors for it. So yes, we have the modern period, you know, uh, which relies on innovation, everyday globalization, multinationalism, and all that. And, uh, and postmodernism has taken those categories into the public realm. Right, so because there are critics who do not think you know postmodernism is a valid term because it is a continuation of uh, modernity, of course. But what modernity has also done, you know, so just like I mentioned, James Joyce, you know, so it has brought the pre-modern back into the modern. So this myth kitty, right? So because you're tired of Western civilization, you know, so at the height of civilization, you have dropped one bomb and killed one million people in Hiroshima. Now is that civilization? Right? So it's like return to the savage, you know, you're worse than a savage, you know, an Aboriginal Australian man with his boomerang can kill one kangaroo. So you can call it, oh, you're killing an endangered species. But what about dropping one bomb and killing one million people? What do you call it then? So we are actually bringing in the pre-modern, so the tradition state and others. But on the other side of the mirror, so of this postmodernity, you know, so we have the convergence and the appropriation. So that's what we have seen in the Harry Potter. That's what we have seen in the Lord of the Rings. So that's what we are seeing in Buffy the Vampire, Twilight Saga, and whatnot. So this return of the repress, you know, and that's where you know the unconscious. So that's where the other is located. So the return for me is a type of appropriation. You know, it is an appropriation of the uncanny, and uncanny is of course you know the familiar becoming unfamiliar. And at the same time, you know, many of you have said it, I totally agree. So it's a desire for a release of mental power from an extremely repressed, repressive culture. Right? So there are repressions, you know, so just like uh, Muktabir was saying, so this whole idea of genocide, you know, so, you know, so in Latin America, so this uh, uh, disappearance, you know, so this abduction, you know, so mass killing. Now, and you need to be in a state of denial, you know, the, and what's going on, and you cannot make sense of it. Like, you know, for me, you know, going on to the Facebook, uh, Facebook, right? I want to be, you know, you know so that uh, proverbial uh, ostrich, right? Because I do not want to see reality. So that's my magical reality, right? So that's, for me, is magic realism, right? So, you know, so my tunnel vision, I'm okay, right? I'm not Tonu, right? I, I love this poster that they have put at Dhaka University. You know, it says, you know, uh, nobody has killed Tonu. It's almost like nobody has killed just Jessica. But the second line is very interesting. You know, Tonu ke meren se jol pai gach. So olive olive trees have killed Tonu. Right? So you know that's magic realism, right? So the olive trees have killed Tonu. That's it. You know, it does not say anything else. Just one poster. Nobody has killed Tonu. You know, olive trees have killed Tonu. That's it. Right? So this whole idea that, you know, how do you negotiate with this reality, right? So in order to come to terms with this kind of absurdity, you know, so in this age of late capitalism, 
you know. So as Adorno says in aesthetic theory, that you need to actually create a fetish against the commodity fetishism. So I'm not explaining commodity fetishism because you know Asperger has so eloquently done it in his um, presentation. So out of this commodity fetishism, so you need to come up again bishavish coin. You know, so curing likeness with likeness. So you have this absurd nonsense, and in order to deal with this absurd nonsense, you need to come up with another absurd nonsense figure, right? So that's for me is the shamanic. So again, you know, Adorno says like you know, late bourgeois ideology has again made it what it was pre-animism, a being itself modeled on the social division of labor, on the split between manual and intellectual labor, on the planned <coughs> domination of the now in the concept of mind himself, consciousness has ontologically justified perpetuated privilege by making it independent of the social principle by which it is constituted. Such ideology explodes in occultism. So this is what we are seeing today. So why? Because the question that I have been asking, you know, so the simple theme of our conference is that why this return? Right? So in a supposedly rational society, why are we embracing the non-rational? You know, why we are so cognizant, you know, about the presence of the non-rational. So when Harry Potter goes diagonally, so yes, you see King's Cross Station, but, you know, there is a magical train that takes him to Hogwarts. Why? Like, you know, I have been to King's, uh, King's Cross Station, I have not seen that train, but still I don't question it. Right? So I probably smile, oh yes, like, you know, maybe there is a secret tunnel, you know, and a secret train taking Harry Potter to a wonderful world of wizardry. Now, I'm, I'm nearly uh, wrapping up actually. So what we have here, so these return, so they are actually kind of a, you know, so they actually deal with our fear. So why, you know, there is this re-emergence? So my interpretation is that, you know, we have a mythical fear radicalized to create a pattern of domination. So by showing the overwhelming presence of the vampire, you know, the zombies out there, right? So they create a pattern of domination. So that has to be a politics, right? So what is the politics? So the domination is intended to, you know, of nature by human beings, that how what human beings can do. Domination of human nature itself, controlling nature itself, and domination of some humans by others, right? Again, dialectic of you know, enlightenment by Adorno. And Adorno so expands two you know, repressive aspects of ideology. So one is it promotes a sense of conformity and submissiveness. This is very dangerous, right? So we, uh, you know, Adorno actually uh, says that uh, nearly 76% uh, of Americans, so they check their horos horoscopes on a daily basis, right? You don't believe, but we just want to see, like, you know, how your day is going to be. So, you know, so you're very, you know, submissive and, you know, you conform to this kind of superstition. In the mass which is fermented by overwhelming production of commodities and manipulates, you know, public opinion so that thought becomes a commodity and language the means of promoting the commodity. You say exactly what Asperger was saying this morning. Right? Now, a mystified notion of immediate correspondence between word and theme is interpolated in order to form a systemic social illusion. Right? So you create a kind of social illusion about reality, and magic is presented as a fetish object for leisurely consumption. Right? So this whole presence of magic, so this is kind of nothing like, you know, so uh, remember that ad they show like, you know, so the husband and wife sitting together and the wife is complaining, why do you show these horror movies because the wife suddenly has become so cuddly, right? And say that this is why, like, you know, so if I had a comedy going on, so you didn't have touched me, right? So because it's a horror movie, so you cling on to me, and, you know, so that's why. You know, so that's kind of idea that is for relation consumption. So you use fear as a strategy. So it becomes a fetish against commodity fetishism, right? And again, so curing. Now, this is exactly what I'm saying. Well, so if you look at, you know, Michael Jackson thriller, the movie, so again, you know, so Michael Jackson is watching a horror movie and the girlfriend becomes friendly after, you know, watching those horror movies, right? So that's exactly how you manipulate fear. Now, Elia does, you know, so again, so he says that, you know, they're not actually sick, so you have to pretend sick and all that, right? So I'll just 
wrap up by referring to my own PhD on the shaman in British poetry. And there are a group of writers who deliberately pretend to be sick. So they write a manifesto about the shamanic manifesto. I'm not going to uh, into detail of this, but basically saying certain artists began to look strange, right? And what they were actually reacting against is Margaret Thatcher, right? And for them, Margaret Thatcher is the bird mother. Because of Margaret Thatcher, they had to transport themselves into a non-rational world. Margaret Thatcher is so irrational. So Margaret Thatcher famously uh, said once, like you know, he, uh, she went to uh, Cambridge University, and there was a student, you know, so reading a book, and uh, Margaret Thatcher asked, you know, my dear boy, what are you reading? And he said, history. And Thatcher said, history, my dear, is a luxury. Right? So we don't need liberal arts, right? So we just need science. Right? Or business administration. Take sir? Yes. Our pro business administration. <laughs> so we don't need the Department of English and Humanities. So Thatcher, you know, we just had 24 students and he is killing me, right, for not having enough students in the English department. Alright. So, yeah, you have a heart. So Thatcher's indifference to the working class and ill treatment of the labor union and the rise of schizophrenic capitalist society many British poets to resort to a type of poetry that defied the logic of traditional. So Thatcher, you know, is eating up. So this is the parody. So this is one of the poets that I uh, have worked on. Brian Catlin is the uh, chair of Ruskin's College at Oxford. And so eating up the bird mother. So in, in one of uh, his installation art, you know, so he made this paper bird and eats it up. You know, so I'm not, as I said, that, and after Margaret Thatcher died, so this is what they did. All right, so this was on April 13th, 2013, and after Thatcher's death, so there was a death party in London, you know, and they all sang, Ding Dong, the witch is dead. <laughs> right? So that's been not very really nice, right? So after your ex-prime minister dies and you say, Ding Dong, the witch is dead. Okay, so this is the title of my book, you know, in which I discuss all the authors, but here it is what I mean by how fear can be used, right? So, see the presence of zombies out there, right? You know, so the zombies, like viruses, you know, so they make you complacent, they make you, you know, so you think that, okay, the fear is out there, it's not happening to us. Now, does it make sense? Yeah. So the non-rational, now does it make sense, right? Who are the zombies? Who are the affected? Who are the affected virus? Right? That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much for again a totally fascinating presentation. Actually, since you ended the part with Margaret Thatcher, let me add uh, from my own country a very relevant uh, quote from Margaret Thatcher's good friend Ronald Reagan. Yes. Now, this is one of these quotes that when you hear it, you cannot believe it is actually real. You think this is something that you know some liberal made up to discredit Ronald Reagan, but it is 100% legitimate. Uh, Ronald Reagan once said, I quote, facts are stupid things. <laughs> yes. So we have until 4.15, 4 5.15, right? So that gives us about 10 minutes uh, for questions. So, I know I have several questions I would love to ask, but since we do have limited time, let me open it up to all of you, first of all. So, in your last slide, you discussed about uh, shamans, or you say priest doctors. Could you differentiate between priest doctors and witch doctors? And are there any differences? Witch doctors? Yeah, I have come across that term several times. So, are there any differences, really? There are different terms, because shaman the idea of shaman, as I said, like you know, for Mitchell, it is very site specific. So, like you know, we have our country Kapali, so who can be very well be uh, shamanic figures. But when you say uh, shaman, according to Elia, that it has to be the Alaskan medicine. But we have used the term other places. But which doctor? So again, like you know, someone can heal and cure. So that would be like you know, so the curing idea. So, but 
Uh, sir, have you come across Witch Doctor? The Witch Doctor would be someone who would create a rain, maybe, uh, you know, uh, do a kind of a uh, change for, or an improvement for a tribe. So a Witch Doctor would be someone who would look after the interests of a community, not so much of an individual. Uh, a shaman, on the other hand, would of course you know, perform these same functions, but there would be a difference of cultural inheritance. And let's not forget, you see, the term witch doctor is once again a Western term. Shaman isn't. So you see, there are two different ways of looking at perhaps the same thing. And I'd also suggest, you know, as you mentioned, witch doctor is a Western term, and of course, since Western culture is coming out of the Judeo-Christian tradition, which has a very derogatory connotation to it, which is not present in shaman or priest doctor. Thank you. Hello everybody, this is Ajay here from East First University. Uh, I don't know whether my question is relevant to the presenter or not, but I'm not, I haven't been able to resist myself from asking that question. The question is that, uh, the conference is about the magic and how does magic I mean exist in our life how we relate with that and the question is that whoever are spreading the magic whoever are taking the advantage whoever are utilizing the behind entire thing is there do you think Dr. Shamsad Murtada um, uh, I mean Murtada I have uh, my question to you that do you think that uh, inside every human being there is a craving for the power I mean, uh, everybody feels the power, that, that the share of power, everybody wants that. It, it is the Almighty. I mean, Almighty in the Quran, in the other religion, we say that He, uh, I mean, whatever the superpower, He has all the power. And so, as He's representative on the earth, uh, we also have the same craving for the power. So, what do you think in this regard? Can I just uh, yeah, sure. one statement here? In fact, joy heart you. Yes. Speaking of that power, you see, John Hodgson, John Hodge is a good friend of mine, and, and I wrote a long piece, in fact, on John Hodgson's poetry, the first post-colonial, within the Korean one. Really? Yeah, exactly. In some ways, to say, that, to say that everything is political is to make all some political kind of fantasy. Mm -hmm. It comes actually from Anthony O'Gramsci, when you speak of the, of the ubiquity of politics. But uh, I think, like, you know, what you're referring to is very romantic. Like, you know, essentially that, that this whole region, primary imagination, the repetition of infinite I am, you know, so the creator and the presence of the creator in you. And Marshall is a great fan of Anal Hawk. Like, you know, so I, I think, like, you know, that is another way Anal of... Anal Hawk? Yes. You know, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, I think, like, you should... Anal Hawk is... No, I think you should expand your idea. Can I... Okay. Yeah. No, no, it's okay. 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 I want to hear... Go no, he's my son, I take it. Go ahead. So I have more chocolate chai. Okay. Anyway, so that again is in the Western epistemes, so this whole idea of the presence of the God. So, you know, you have it everywhere in pantheism, like, you know, and of course in romanticism and all that. But the idea, like, you know, the very definition of myth that I would use, you know, is that you know, it is a narrative, you know, uh, used to explain and control mm -hmm. the sound. So our ancestors used that narrative. It's a story, you know, in order to explain. You know, so because our ancestors were not fortunate enough to be born, you know, uh, with uh, uh, with a holy book, so they had to explain for themselves, you know, so why the volcano is angry. So maybe there is a dragon breathing fire, you know, from there. You know, so they had to come up with a kind of an anthropomorphic, you know, explanation to it. So yes, so this idea that you know how can I appease this dragon? Okay, by throwing a maiden into that volcano. You know? So that kind of thing, like you know, so yes, you have this desire to control nature. You know, and uh, I cannot resist myself, like you know, because we talked about the witch, and one of the explanations of the origin of witches, you know, for example, uh, in a hunting uh, or hunting gathering society, like you know, so for example, women could not join the hunt because they had period or they were pregnant and all that. So they were left behind to look after the fire. And eventually, you know, so you are so powerful that you can control fire. Right? So that was thrown back, you know, to women by saying that because you control fire, you know, so that's why you must be a witch because you're so powerful that even fire listens to you. But her job was simply to, you know, uh, 
add on good states to the burning fire that you have brought through lightning, you know, or, or uh, for some other reason. Okay. So my question is, uh, I'm sure we everyone told that magic takes the form of fetish. Yes. So from that point, and you talked about uh, Facebook. So in Facebook, they actually don't see each other, but we're communicating through it. And Facebook has got this different language. Not Facebook, but when we communicate, because we don't see each other. And sometimes we use emoticons. And Mashusa uses very much. He communicates through emoticons all the time. And this is a kind of trick of my own. Do you expect? But when I see you in the real life, can I find the same narrative which I use in the Facebook? Doesn't it create a kind of fear when I communicate with, you, with the people? Because I communicate with you through Facebook, now in real life I'm communicating with you with different narrative and different language. And how could I find that emoticon which I can uh, use it very uh, commonly? I don't want to monopolize the <laughs> uh, uh, Well, I mean, uh, I think I didn't get the question. I mean, is it that how can we uh, face uh, something that we uh, virtually face? I mean, how, how, uh, how can we face something in real, what we have faced in uh, face virtually, is it? Yeah. And how could I retrieve that language which I have used in language? Because real life communication is very different. Yes. And how could I get the emoticon which I have so easily used over there? Uh, uh, you well, in real life you don't need the emoticon, you, 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 you can smile. Uh, so. <laughs> I can smile and say, do you No, for example, you know, I have almost 1,000 friends. Like, you know, so yeah, I actually have Sakib, like, you know, yesterday, one of my students. You know, so he is on my list. But, like, you know, he came up to me, sir, did you recognize me? I didn't even recognize him, right? So, like, you know, so this whole idea, like, you know, so Facebook, Again, it's a make-believe world, you know, so it's a very narcissistic world, so you just like, you know, so you see a post, you like it, and that doesn't necessarily mean there is an actual communication there, right? But yes. like is often considered as a kind of recognition, acknowledgement, acknowledgement, it. right, not necessarily that I like it, yes, I was here, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, living at, living at rest. In fact, sometimes people will specifically comment, oh, when I like this, it doesn't mean I like it. Yes. <laughs> especially like a, 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 a sad news or a... Uh, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, so I, I wanted to, uh, to conclude this session with uh, a quote that I think is highly relevant to these presentations coming from a novel that I know I love, and I'm sure many people in the room do as well, uh, Midnight's Children. Uh, that is, in a country where the truth is what it is, excuse me, in a country where the truth is what it is instructed to be, reality, quite literally, ceases to exist. Uh, so, finally, can I just ask for two rounds of applause, first of all, for our two excellent presenters. And second of all, now I, I very personally now know the hard work and the frustration and the madness and the sleep deprivation that comes with organizing a conference because I went through the same thing myself a few months ago at NSU. So um, I, I'm well aware now of how difficult it is. So can we also have a round of applause for the wonderful organizers of this very successful conference.